Hello, and thank you very much for having me. So, as I said, my name is Jessie Hunt, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I'm a marketing consultant in London, and it's my first time in Poland. I arrived yesterday. So, London is a fascinating world city and a really exciting place to work within the arts. And I'm humbled that I've had the opportunity to work with many leading cultural attractions that showcase some of the best world of the world's objects and art and attracting visitors from across the globe. So to give you an outline of what I cover in my presentation, so I'll be taking you on a journey across um, with some of the best examples of marketing and communications in London that I've seen recently. And I'll give you a how-to in um, promoting the arts, and along the way, I'll share with you tips, trends, and give you some tools. Um, I'll then give you some insight into some recent projects that I've worked on, including at the Victorian Albert Museum, and then exhibition um, at Tate Modern. You'll then have the opportunity to ask me questions. And of, of course, please do come and talk to me after the presentation. If you're on Twitter and you're tweeting, my Twitter handle is at Jesse Hunt. And there's a lot of information in my presentation. And there might be words that are difficult to translate. And so do feel reassured that my presentation will be available afterwards so you can have a look. So first of all, a little about me. Uh, so I was born in the same area as Shakespeare, right in the middle of England. And like Shakespeare, I moved to London, and I've devoted my working life to the arts and to culture. I'm a marketing consultant. At the moment, I work at Tate Modern. So Tate Modern is this enormous building that you can see here. And it's situated right next to Shakespeare's Globe, which is this smaller wooden um, building next to it. And so I am fascinated by the juxtaposition of um, culture and arts in London and um, with having Tate Modern, this modern contemporary art gallery right next to the Shakespeare's Globe um, is what makes London really exciting for me. Um, so when I was in, invited to come to Gdansk and I found out that there's a Shakespeare's theatre and so many museums and galleries, I was really excited and I knew that I'd feel right at home. And I certainly do because my hotel is right next to the Shakespeare's theatre here. <laughs> So during my career, I've worked at lots of different institutions um, from independent and national organizations. Um, so recently, Tate and the V&A, and I had six years working as marketing manager at the British Museum. And as all good marketeers, um, I'd love to get to know my audience here. And so this is my postcard from London to you. I took this postcard when I was in Trafalgar Square, uh, right in the middle of, um, of London, just outside the National Gallery. Um, so I'd love to have a raise of hands of how many people have been to London who've had a chance to be. Okay. Oh, so lots of, lots of you have had the opportunity. So for those who haven't, haven't raised their hands and haven't been, um, hopefully over the presentation I'll be able to excite you and encourage you to come visit and explore some of London's culture. So when I was in Trafalgar Square in that place where I took that photo of the postcard, um, that's when I first had my really exciting moment with arts and culture in London, and it's what inspired me to, to work in the arts. Um, this is what I believe is to be the best arts marketing campaign I've ever seen, and um, it, it really inspires me. It still inspires me today. So this is a rocket that crash-landed in London, in, the, in London streets, and it started the most magical weekend in, in London. Um, the rocket was opened, and inside out came this um, mechanical puppet girl. She was absolutely enormous, and she was joined by this mechanical elephant, and it was the biggest piece of free theatre in London, and it had an audience of over one million people. Um, the show had this grand finale in Trafalgar Square, and the audience was moved to tears. It was beautiful. Um, so what was really special to, for me about this campaign is that it was purely a word-of-mouth campaign. Um, so this was completely before um, social media kicked off. This was 
10 years ago. Um, the event was a complete surprise for Londoners. Um, we hadn't been told about it beforehand. There were no posters, there were no flyers, and um, the press had even agreed to an embargo, and the BBC um, reported this rocket arriving in London as though it was actually real. And so the important thing for me um, in remembering about marketing campaigns is, um, and especially for this one, was that it was carefully planned and the company was incredibly creative with um, the way that they carried out this, um, this marketing campaign and with the storytelling in it. It completely embraced word of mouth marketing and getting people excited and engaged. Um, so when I need a reminder about um, arts marketing, this is, is the um, piece of inspiration I always look to. So just a few weeks ago, the same company that put on that piece 10 years ago, um, we, were, we were treated to another free spectacle from them. Um, the company's name is Artichoke. Um, so Lumiere London um, in January was a weekend of over 30 spectacular light installations across the city. So roads were closed and the streets became a magical playground, encouraging lo Londoners and tourists to see the city centre in a new light. And over a million people visited over the four nights and it drove visits during a time when London is, is much quieter, usually. So for me, what was really interesting about the difference um, between seeing that piece 10 years ago and then this piece um, back in January was the difference that digital had made to the marketing campaign. So this wasn't a surprise event in the way that the um, previous event, event had been, um, but it was all about, it embraced digital in, in all its glory. So uh, the campaign included immersive photography, video, they created an app, and um, you could see the same with visitors in the way that they embraced it, that they were there. You could see smartphones glowing with everyone taking photos. Um, so it was fascinating to see, for me, these, um, these two campaigns and, and showed to me that, um, how um, important digital now is as part of the campaign. So what I'd like to show you is um, some inspirational art marketing. Um, but first of all, I want to say, well, how, how do you do art marketing? And I know within this audience that there'll be many of you who know exactly how to do this. Um, so I'm sure there'll be lots of people nodding their heads. Um, but I'd like to show you my 10 steps that I take when preparing a marketing plan. And I'll give you some examples throughout. Um, so the first thing is to know your market. And um, so what you can do is, is desk research, and you can do it in, in many different ways. And this is an example of a piece of work called Audience Atlas, which is available in the UK. Um, so what we know is that 85% of the UK population is in the market for arts, culture, and heritage. So there's enormous pot potential for reaching audiences. But I mean, I'd probably say that we don't don't engage with this, this number. Um, so there's still an enormous amount of work to be done. Um, but there are uh, lots of pieces of audience research that are available to access to find out more. Um, and then it's about finding out what else is going on, what are the leisure, cultural activities, events there are that are competing for your audience's time. Um, and then perhaps there are opportunities there for cross-promotion. Um, so, for example, you can look at Google Trends. So, this is where you can search in, um, type in search terms and find out what people are, are, are finding out about and searching for. Um, and Google Keywords is another example of where you can find out a lot of information and data about what, what people are actually looking for, and it's completely free. Um, so, what I did was I typed in the British Museum. And this is the page that it came up with, with lots of data. And um, so it tells you things like the kinds of questions that people are asking when they're searching for the British Museum, um, where in the world they're searching for. Um, also here, there's when they're searching what objects they're interested in at the museum. And so this is really useful because it means that you can start to build programming, you can start to build content, that things that people are actually interested in looking for. Um, and so you can also see here at the bottom of the page that the British Museum has just launched a partnership with Google. 
activity here. So this is an example of Facebook Insights. So this is where you can log in to your page's Facebook and find out lots of data about your audience, um, so where they're from, what kind of content they're, they're really liking. Um, and you can also have a look at what your competitors are doing. So here I've got some examples of the Metropolitan Museum, British Museum Tate, National Gallery compared against each other for social media engagement. So you can see that the Metropolitan Museum of Art there is doing incredibly well for um, engagement this week. And my second point is to learn all about your audiences through market research. So we've heard a little bit about that already. Um, and it's really important to find the resource and budget to, to make this happen because it will save you money in the long run because it means that your um, marketing is more closely targeted. So here's a photo of my colleague David from when I worked at the British Museum doing um, research in the Great Court. Um, and I've done this as well, going down, actually talking to your audience. It's very easy to just sit behind your desk and, and not talk to, talk to your audience. Um, and then you might also wish to use online tools for asking questions. So this is a website that I've used a lot called SurveyMonkey, and it's a way to then um, send out questions. You can send it via email. Um, it's reasonably cheap to use, and it's got really strong analytical tools, so really good ways of being able to find out more data and, and cross-tab data. Um, and you could, of course, outsource to a market, uh, market research agency, and there are many out there with cultural specialisms. And increasingly now, there's market research agencies who are looking at arts and culture and with a global view. Um, so also, you can get together with other organisations to do this, and that's something that we do in, in the UK, is that the museums and galleries have clubbed budget together to be able to conduct market research. Um, and then also working with tourism and government agencies to be part of their market research. So most important is this, that this is embedded within your organisation. So, um, the, idea for, uh, the ideal for your organisation is that it is led by its vision, um, but it, that it is focused on its audience, so audiences at the heart. Um, so in terms of doing your market research, it's about involving different people from across the organisation, so especially curators, I have found. So if you have a focus group, for example, where you're inviting people in to ask them questions, perhaps members of staff could go and sit in on, on that. Um, also, then having regular presentations about your audience research, preparing that for staff. Um, and one of the things that I saw recently when I went to the offices at a major newspaper in the UK was that they had vinyl infographics on their walls. So it had lots of information and data about their audiences. So it was this regular reminder about, about the audiences. And so I was thinking that would look great to have in the canteen at, um, at Tate. Um, and then, so yeah, it's, it's about involving people, but also, maybe another idea could be that you could just print out your posters of, with data and put it on the walls in your office, just as a starter. So then making smart objectives, so making sure that they are specific, that they're measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, and if you don't think that your targets are achievable, then making sure that you're involved in that target setting, going right back to the start, working um, with the curatorial team in terms of what the programming is, really start, starting from, from the beginning, making sure that market research is involved at all times. So you know about your audiences now because you've done your market research, but then who best to target? Um, so the best thing to do is obviously to target a fewer number of audiences and do it really well rather than trying to appeal to all. Um, so there are many ways to segment your audiences, and this is one example from the UK called Culture Segments. And what it is, is it's based on deeply held beliefs about the arts. So it's not about demographics, it's not about where you live or how old you are, it's actually how, how you feel and how you re react to the, the arts. Um, so, for example, the um, segment stimulation, which is this one in orange up at the top, um, this is a segment that 
likes to be the first to find out what's going on in the arts. Um, they then want to be able to tell their friends and say that they've done it first. Um, they are interested in some more of the risky type of art forms. Um, so that's just, just one example, and there are many, and you can find out and see pen, what we call pen portraits. So um, you can see all of those online. And this shows how you can then target your different segments at different stages of the campaign. So this shows a timeline for the campaign. So for example, when I said about targeting the audience who want to be, hear about it first and then tell all of their friends, they are on the left-hand side. And then um, the one that is in yellow, they are the type of audience that like to listen to what their friends have had to say. They want to then read press reviews. So they come later on in the campaign. So you can start to then see how, so how each of them are targeted at different stages. And then the next step is to write your key messages. So what is it that's most important to say? Is it that it's free? Is it the name of the artist? Or if the artist is not known, is it the experience? What are those things that, that really draw in audiences? So it's about selecting between three and five messages and testing them if you can. And then in terms of devising your strategy, so um, how it is that you're going to then reach all of those things, your objectives, your audiences. Um, so this needs to be a, a summary, um, a few paragraphs about those steps that you're going to take. And then doing this in phases. So I mentioned earlier about the audience segments and when you target them. So this is a typical exhibition life cycle. So it shows it over time. So the first peak here is um, when the exhibition opens, and then the peak at the end is toward, uh, when it's closing. And this is obviously how you want your campaign to look. So if you split it out into these phases, um, then that's when you can then start to see um, that sort of shape in your um, ticket sales. So I mentioned about budget, and of course without budget and resource, then none of this is going to be possible. Um, and it's all about making sure that you have, um, you're getting return on investment. Um, and then getting creative, so using a visual identity, working with really good designers to make sure that you've got strong standout, clear messaging, and call to action. So in terms of your tactics, this is the details of exactly how you're going to carry out the campaign. So I tend to, um, when managing a project, I'll keep this in a separate document and I'll use an Excel spreadsheet and I call it, this is called a Gantt chart. And so what I'll have is listed out all of the examples of the marketing, so whether it's on-site signage, whether it is an advertisement in the Times newspaper, or whether it's a blog, um, so listing out all of your different content, what social media you'll have at each stage. and then across has shown the timing. So this then helps you to start planning out those phases of the campaigns and working out which audiences your target when. And then obviously evaluation and reporting, which is essential as we all know. Um, but obviously budget and resource needs to be planned out from the start. So that's just a really quick summary of, of my top step for making a marketing plan. So next on to what I've found works that, um, in my arts marketing. Um, and so the decision making process for engaging with the arts has become increasingly complex. And here is a diagram that shows just how involved the purchase journey is for car insurance. So this is something essential that everyone in the UK has to have, and obviously much more boring than the arts. Um, but what it shows it is that um, over a period of time, um, there's many different things, actions that had to be taken to be able to buy this um, this car insurance in terms of the number of websites, those five different websites, um, 
uh, that were visited, 34 minutes was taken to decide about this car insurance. And obviously the model for engaging in the arts is, is it's an entirely different proposition. But I think it's worth considering in terms of those number of touch points, we call them. So all of those places that um, you, you uh, that audience might hear about you or find out about you, um, all of the different ways that they might engage, and then also remembering about things like they're going to have to convince their friend to go with them, or they're going to have to think about um, how they might get there, all of those other barriers or, or things that need to be considered for um, before they engage with you. So you need to make sure that your marketing campaign is addressing all of those things. Um, so going back to the question as to what works, what I found, and this is based on market research, um, the top responses are always word of mouth marketing. Um, so this is, uh, and then the, the next one is outdoor advertising. So this is um, in London, we have London ad uh, advertising on the London Underground, and um, what we've found um, over the last few years, because there's lots of arts organisations now do use London Underground for advertising, and you see lots of arts and publishers, and um, it now it's almost like read, reading a magazine as you walk through the London Underground, that it's, um, it's a way of finding out what is on in London, and so we found that, that audiences are now saying that that is how they find out about what is on in London, so it's now pretty much essential to, to be able to advertise there. Um, but in terms of entry points for um, budget, it's around £10,000 um, for, for doing one burst of advertising. So it's a significant amount of money um, it's into your um, budget. And then follow, uh, so the following thing would then be... Um, a range of touch points, so by this I mean um, the website that people find out about through the website, um, on-site signage, and then through other channels. Um, the other thing to point out is that uh, social media is also listed as surprisingly low down on that list, so around 5%, um, but over the last few years that we have seen that increasing. And then obviously with word of mouth, people might say that they've heard about it through a friend, but they've actually heard about it on Facebook or, or one of those channels. Um, so just to then talk about this word of mouth marketing, because I've mentioned it a few times now, and just to make sure that it is very clear. Um, so what I mean is that it's these techniques to get people talking about you. So it's marketing activities to, to encourage people to talk. And um, the reason why it's important, so here are some stats. So 67% of all consumer decisions are primarily influenced by word of mouth. And um, also, this is a, a, another really important point, is that 90% of conversations about brands happen offline. And so it's not all just about social media. Um, and so therefore, it's, it's worth thinking about that. And next I want to mention about the power of working in partnership with other brands to be able to reach audiences. And I mentioned earlier about the British Museum par partnering with Google. And um, here is an example in the photograph from Tate when Tate worked with a shop called Liberty, um, which is just off, off Oxford Street in London. And... Um, the Tate created windows inspired by an exhibition campaign on Matisse. And so the, all of the windows of the shop, and, and there was lots of coverage within the shop about the exhibition. And what I've found is that many brands, in fact, most brands that I've asked, um, do really wish to be associated with the arts uh, because it means that it gives them good good content. Um, it's not, not everyone wants to talk about car insurance all the time. Um, and so it's that as long as the, the brand is a, a strong fit, a good fit for your organisation and, and says something uh, about the organisation, um, then you can think of some really creative ways to engage with audiences. And the most important point as well is that it's quite often for free that brands will then do this for free. 
And so we've talked to a little bit already about digital trends and, and digital, and um, I wanted to talk about being uh, digital first. Um, digital first is a way of thinking through your strategy. Um, so a few stats as statistics to um, emphasize why that's really important. So there's now more Google searches on mobile than there are on computers. So that happened in May for the first time last year. Um, so just thinking about the way that, that our audiences are evolving and using their mobiles and using digital technology and arts organisations need to be doing the same. And so digital is obviously an essential part of our lives. Um, and then there's, I, there are many trends for 2016 and a few of them have been mentioned already, but I just wanted to highlight a few that I thought, um, I think are, are really important for the arts this year. Um, so stuffocation, um, so this is a new word, so you might not have come across this before, uh, but this is the idea that brands um, will be rewarded by being able to create and deliver experiences. So obviously that's a big thumbs up for the um, arts because that's all about what we do. Um, so we've seen trends in terms of experiential entertainment. So organisations such as Punch Drunk, which is a theatre company, um, and Secret Cinema is another trend at the moment. And in terms of the cultural sector, this gives strong opportunities for museums and galleries and um, performing arts venues. So there's, um, museums and galleries quite often have these late events now where um, museums are open later in the evenings and there's entertainment and there's drinks and food um, and then behind the scenes events. Um, but I think what this then offers is these new opportunities for engaging with um, more experiential events. Um, and so this is another way that I, I certainly see the arts moving. And then, um, sorry. also the um, content is still king. So I mentioned about ad blocking. So content marketing is, um, really important because it's needed for Google search, um, obviously for social media sharing and for audiences that are doing research. And I've highlighted here about ad blocking. Um, so Apple um, have now installed um, ad blocking, so it means that web advertising, banner advertising, uh, pop-ups and videos, so many of the things that um, I've, we've been using at the arts organisations I've worked at um, will be blocked. And so it means that content is now more important than ever because this, this, um, this won't be blocked. And so that includes things like infographics, your web pages, content, podcasts, videos, blogs, and then also video. So um, a, a stat here is that 74% of all web traffic will be driven by video in 2017. Um, so I've got an interesting example here from the British Museum who recently crowdsourced to get ideas for content for videos. So what they did was they asked which areas of the collection people wanted to know about. And what was found to be most popular was this idea of curator's corner. So to have curators um, talking about objects. And um, so you can see here on the top left is um, one of the curators. And um, the videos that have been created have had incredibly engaged responses so far. Also, I wanted to do mention about diversity and access in the arts because um, it's crucial to the arts and um, as arts marketeers, it's our duty to be able to um, encourage wider engagement within the arts. Um, so this is always part of um, our marketing plans. And this example here is um, a theatre called Everyman Theatre in Manchester. And I'd highly recommend you looking it up right from the outset, from the, um, the way that the building has been constructed, right through to the performances that are put on, all about um, diversity. And this is a really good case study. Um, you can find out more on the Arts Council England website. 
So I wish to show you some creative examples that I've seen recently um, and that have inspired me. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about I Love Museums, which was an advocacy campaign that ran last year in the lead up to the government's spending review. So in the UK, um, museums have been facing cuts to funding, and this campaign was led by the National Museums Directors' Council, and it was designed to show politicians the value of museums and um, to say that any cuts to funding should be minimal. So the campaign took place across the UK, and here it is at the Imperial War Museum in London. And... Um, Museums could find templates for advocacy posters, for badges, for logos, and there are many ways that um, museums could encourage um, support. Um, so this is an online pledge form uh, where links to social media and Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And so in November, so um, after this campaign, um, we did expect cuts of funding between 30 and 40 percent. But actually, it was, it was good news that didn't happen for our national museums, and um, funding has, is going to stay the same for the next four years. So it's good news for national museums. Um, so this, I think this campaign certainly did go some way to be able to um, encourage support for museums. Um, but the fight is, is certainly still on for our smaller museums and for regional museums because there may be cuts coming in the future. Um, one of the interesting things that the person who was running this campaign has said is that um, many people had no idea that um, museums were facing such difficulties in, in terms of funding. So I think obviously when working in the arts, you hear all of these stories all the time, but it's very easy to forget that audiences don't understand that museums and galleries are char charities and, and need that funding too. So that's a, a really important message to continue to communicate. And so next I want to mention about the, um, this exhibition which is called Tibet's Secret Temple at the Welcome Collection in London. And um, so with so many posters around London to mention about these adverts, um, it's really difficult to get cut through. And um, so what they did was um, they used the posters in a really creative way. And I like this one because I, I know in coming to Gdansk that I'll be able to see some murals on the walls. Um, so this was inspired by mural in the exhibition. And this is still up at the moment, it's, it's only just launched. Um, so this is what they did, was that they started out with posters like this, and then they worked with, um, with artists to be able to then fill the posters. And so they ended up looking like this. And so what this shows is um, where there is that combination of outdoor advertising that I mentioned, but also then encouraging word of mouth and, and engagement and doing something different. And this exhibition, Ai Weiwei, at the Royal Academy of Arts, this was an exhibition of um, this contemporary Chinese artist um, held in autumn last year. And it was absolutely a, a standout case for exhibition marketing in, in many different ways. Um, but I wanted to just draw on three examples of, of the campaign. First, from this is a, a Kickstarter campaign. So this is for getting funding. So um, this is a website where people can pledge money. And what they did was they wanted to have some of the artworks brought in. So they asked people to fund the, these artworks being um, brought to the UK. And um, people could get really funny um, there, were the, the, there was a video that people could watch to find out more about it. Um, but if you pledged money, you could get things like a, a, a wink from the artist's cat. And so they had lots of fun and playful ways of encouraging people to, to donate to the campaign. And it was a, a runaway success. And they got their funding very quickly. Um, through to um, selfies being encouraged in the exhibition. So this is a newspaper story of this taking off because um, photography isn't usually allowed in exhibitions in the UK. And so to allow people to take photography became this really big story and, and um, 
it was fascinating to see how many people did engage with photography going around the exhibition through to this um, immersive film. So I very much encourage you to have a look at it. So it's a 360 film. Um, so it's taken in the exhibition and you can walk through and there's um, ways that you can then listen to the curators talking. Um, and so it's a, a, a really, um, I suppose with the way that film is now moving, um, Facebook have uh, started doing their 360 films. Um, so this is the kind of technology um, that we'll certainly be seeing more museums and galleries using in the future. Um, so I've now covered um, some examples from across London. And now what I'd like to do is give some examples of things that I've worked on myself at the VNA and then on to Tate. So the VNA is the world's leading museum of art and design. It's in London and it's free to visit. It um, houses unrivaled collections of contemporary and historic objects. And the spectacular setting of the museum showcases um, decorative arts from all over the world. So the V&A has um, made news around the world recently um, for an exhibition of the um, fashion designer Alexander McQueen. So it was the V&A's most successful exhibition ever, had nearly 500,000 people visiting it. And um, in the final two weekends, the V&A was open during the night. And the marketing campaign itself was exceptional. It was all over London. Everyone was oh, across the UK, in fact. And everyone was talking about it. And there was a significant overseas campaign as well. Um, and I think also going back to talking about film, there's um, some excellent examples of marketing films that you can see on, on the web pages still. Um, so my work at the V&A um, was last autumn, so just after the exhibition had closed. And um, I was brought in to write a brief for the strategy to increase the number of overseas visitors to the V&A. Um, the V&A is very successful anyway. It's one of the top attractions in London. But it's going through a huge period of transformation at the moment with the refurbishment of many of the um, permanent galleries. Um, and then it's going to have have a new entrance that will be opening onto Exhibition Road, which is where the Natural History Museum is and the Science Museum is in London. Um, and then also working internationally, there's a partnership gallery that's being built in China that will open in 2017. So there's huge amounts of work going on with the, the V&A. And the Victorian Albert Museum is also, it's got the Museum of Childhood, which was mentioned earlier in one of the examples. Um, so it's got a huge... Um, huge numbers of domestic audiences and, and um, significant number of overseas visitors, um, but it's not top on the list of, of um, for overseas visitors to, to visit. So um, with the success of the um, Alexander McQueen exhibition having made such huge headlines, it's a really strong opportunity to be able to encourage overseas audiences. So how did I approach this brief? So in developing the strategy, I did a significant piece of work for the V&A. Um, I made a, an assessment into the V&A's current position within the London visitor market. So at the moment, it's it, um, it listed as number seven. And then I made projections for the V&A looking at the market for tourists to London over the next five years, and I worked out what proportion of visitors the V&A could be expecting. And then I looked at what the opportunities were for growth, so where we could then increase that, um, and then wrote this detailed marketing strategy for the next five years for increasing tourists. Um, so this is an example of one of the V&A's tourism marketing campaigns. So this is targeting UK audiences. So this is, is already in existence. So in the strategy, what was the king gap was then how we could create a new campaign that is purely for overseas tourists to help explain what the V&A is and to then highlight the aspects of the museum that would appeal to those audiences. And it was very different for each audience segment of um, overseas, from overseas. 
Um, so in terms of doing this research, I talked to tourism partners and agencies, did um, lots of, had lots of discussion with staff and um, at the museum and then peers within the sector. Um, I worked with a research agency and I delved into past reports and had a look at, uh, there was a wealth of data that already existed. And I worked with a media agency and I looked at the best solutions for tourism advertising. I also did lots of research on TripAdvisor, Google, social analytics, and looking at um, information that already existed to be able to add more data to the report. And so, for example, this is a slide that's taken from a research report from London and Partners, which is the research, um, sorry, is the tourism agency for London. And what it shows is the most important factors for influencing a visit to London. And right at the top of the list is um, word of mouth, and then the internet, and then followed by things around London, so advertising around London, and then guidebooks. Um, and another aspect was looking at booking trends. There's quite interesting data around bookings, and what it showed is that 30% um, of London's tourists don't book tickets, and they were least likely to book tickets for museums. So museums are free to visit in, in the UK. Many of them are free. Um, but what it shows is that museums and galleries can be doing so much more to encourage visits, um, selling exhibition tickets, but also looking at those other opportunities for upselling, so um, the catering offer that people are looking for, and um, the shops, and um, all of those different um, secondary spend opportunities. So what were my findings for the v and um, It was that there was this huge opportunity for increasing the number of overseas visitors, but what it really needed was um, to have dedicated staffing and budget to be able to deliver this. Um, and that tourist markets, they needed to um, be segmented and then targeted with particular messaging and particular offers for each of those markets. So for example, with the USA, um, there was a huge number of USA tourists that are expected to London over the next five years. And they all arrive in the morning, early morning in London, and then they can't check, in, check into their hotels until um, two or three o'clock. And so in the morning, they're left wandering around London and looking for something to do to, to kill some time before they go and book into their hotels. And what they're actually looking for is for breakfast or for um, something to eat and to have a sit down. So the opportunity there for the v &A is that it has the most spectacular cafe, um, which was designed by a famous artist called William Morris. And um, so we talked about uh, having an opportunity to have a special English breakfast so that we can draw audiences um, into the museum um, and offer them what they need and then they can go and see the spectacular British galleries whilst they're there and have an introduction to Britain in the v all in the v and um, So then it's this capitalising on, on income generation, so all of those opportunities to in encourage um, them to spend their money. So my top tips if you're going to be doing your own tourism marketing research. Um, so to mention again that tourism agencies have this wealth of research data and um, for example Visit Britain and it might be interesting to go and have a look at this yourselves. Um, this is information all about Polish visitors to the UK and the significant amount of data that can be downloaded. And then to look to the most popular attractions and see what they're doing well. So the British Museum is the most popular attraction in London. So what does it do? And so this is just a very small list of the things that the British Museum does to encourage overseas visitors. Um, so, um, yeah, I, th I suppose it's, it's then looking to see what others are doing differently. Um, and then also understanding what word of mouth and the influence of that. Um, so one of the things that I found on TripAdvisor is that you can filter the comments by country. And so what that really gives you is, is great qualitative data as to what different audiences are, are interested in and what they dislike when they come to your organization. 
So next I want to talk about my experience of working at Tate. So as I said earlier, Tate Gallery is, uh, Tate Modern is the free um, gallery in central London and it's the most visited modern art gallery in the world. Um, it's home to the Tate collection of international art from 1900 to today. And in my current, current contract, I work as marketing manager and I've worked at Tate for the last year. Um, so Tate Modern opened in the year 2000 and it's been a catalyst for transformation of public attitudes to uh, the visual arts. It's um, a top attraction in London and it has 6 million visitors per year and 60% of its visitors are under 35 and over th uh, around 50% are from overseas. So the building itself is a converted power station and it was designed by the same person that designed the UK's iconic red telephone box. And in Tate Modern, you can take in the full sweep of modern art in one visit. So from iconic works to the latest performance and photographic art. So each of the wings focuses on major art movements and themes. And uh, iconic works include Marcel Duchamp's Fountain which is a urinal, and it is known as one of the most iconic works of 20th century art, to Pablo Picasso's Weeping Woman, and Roy Lichtenstein's Wham. And there are also um, Polish art is, is represented in Tate's collection too, and forgive my pronunciation, uh, but this immersive piece by Magdalena Abakanowicz. So the Turbine Hall in the centre of Tate Modern is a, an enormous free space um, where every year a contemporary artist is commissioned to create an artwork in the space. And since opening, over 60 million visitors have experienced the Turbine Hall and it's earned a unique place in the public imagination. And what it has done, I think, for Tate is um, it's... It's created this space where visitors can just turn up and um, just hang out in this space. So it's in talking about lifestyle and creating um, more of a lifestyle for, um, for the arts, uh, I think that the Turbine Hall has absolutely done this um, for the arts in London, that it is this space that people can, can hang out and there'll always be something for them to see or something for them to do. So in 2009, um, we also had a Polish artist, um, Mirosław Balka, uh, created this monumental work called How It Is, um, which was this giant grey steel sculpture. And this is the current commission that's in the space at the moment by a Mexican artist called Abraham Cruz Villegas. So Tate Modern at the moment is going through a huge transformation and when you visit right at the, this moment you can see um, changes to the London skyline. So there's a huge building being built, so you can see it here on the right hand side. Um, so it's going to be a 10 storey extension with 60% more space and it, up on the top it will have 360 degree views over London and so the marketing campaign for the relaunch of the new Tate Modern because it includes a complete rehang um, and will be a, a game changer in terms of the art scene in London um, so it opens on the 17th of June and um, the marketing campaign is um, certainly something to watch out for this year because it, it will certainly define 2016 um, for the arts world and arts marketing so Tate has a, a history of inspiring um, marketing campaigns so this was an, an example called your collection um, back in 2005 and it was a series of tours that were devised inspired by visitors feedback so for example you could take the yellow tour of the collection and it included this campaign which won many awards um, which was um, a long copy so it's a poster where you have the opportunity to spend time reading through the copy um, which is all about being hungover and it's very funny. <laughs> 
Um, so through to, this is the Tate Weather, which is a campaign that tapped into the British obsession with the weather, because the weather, so we like to talk about it a lot. Um, so it had live updates on the weather, which was projected onto screens in, uh, on the London Underground. And um, so each time the weather was shown, it showed an artwork um, um, in the collection that was inspired. Um, and so this campaign actually came from an idea um, from social media. So it started out as a social media campaign and it was so popular and it still is so popular um, that they, we've then turned it into an actual campaign. Um, and so next I want to talk to you about the exhibition that we've got on at the moment, which is our blockbuster exhibition on Alexander Calder. So this opened in November 2015 and it runs through until April. So Alexander Calder was a radical American artist and he was a pioneer with kinetic and wire sculptures and he is most famous for inventing the mobile. So the exhibition is a charged for exhibition and it's at 18 pounds, so it's quite a significant ticket price. And Tate relies on income sources through ticketing because the rest of Tate is free. And so our marketing objective is um, to encourage the maximum ticket sales as we can for the exhibition. So to inform the marketing strategy, research was conducted with culturally engaged audiences. And we used an independent market research agency for this. And what it showed us was that awareness of Alexander Calder as an artist was quite low. So at 26% of those interviewed, Whereas um, in the same set of research, we asked about other artists, and for example, Matisse, he is um, about 68%. So you can see that there's a, a long way to go in terms of raising awareness of the artist. Um, what it also showed with, was that there was strong interest. So 80% of people were really interested in finding out more, and also that people were interested in this idea of movement and motion, kinetic sculpture. Um, but also that we needed to um, give the campaign more substance because um, people wanted to know that there was more than just mobiles on display. So as a blockbuster exhibition, the strategy is to attract a, a mass audience. Um, and so we broke it down into segments and we used the culture segment segmentation that I mentioned earlier. And so looking at culturally active audiences, those living in London, but also in regional cities, um, people that have uh, perhaps been to take before to see um, exhibitions. Um, and also people that are interested in, in knowing more about modern, the modernist art movement. Um, so also families, because we knew from the research that Calder's work was particularly attractive to adults and children, and then also tourism marketing, because as an American, audio, uh, American artist, um, he had a, uh, has a strong art fan base in the USA. So the strategy has been to deliver a really clear Exhibition, exhibition proposition um, that Alexander Calder is a big name in modern art and that his moving sculptures are an exciting and essential cultural experience, this being a must-see exhibition. So it was a paid-for campaign and it was underpinned with compelling content, so blogs and social media and film, all to give substance. So the strategy has been digital first and this has been a, a real shift for Tate and it's been a, a strong opportunity to explore the idea of movement throughout the whole campaign. So what we did was we started out with um, the creative process by making a moving visual identity. Um, so this, uh, this piece is actually a film and we then, in starting out with this, we then use that to inform the static elements of the campaign. So this is a really different way of working with the designers. Um, and then with the advanced campaign, so we started the campaign back in January 2015 with early messaging through press and through all of Tate's marketing channels as well um, to aim to, to tell people about who Alexander Calder was um, and explaining his importance and appeal. And um, the show was then 
launched with a huge splash in London, and we used digital screens. Um, so we showed these digital trailers to show these mobiles moving through space, and then we used digital advertising on publisher spaces, um, social media advertising, and press advertising. We also had a major partnership with the Sunday Times and Times newspapers. Um, so that included an event in the exhibition and a competition to win a trip to New York, um, which was all promoted through the newspaper's channels. And um, we then had um, coverage across the Tate membership marketing, um, on site to all of Tate's branches. Tate has four branches. Um, online and then in all of Tate's magazines and print. And then post Christmas, so just after Christmas, and so in January, uh, we've had a, a high impact, large scale campaign that's taken place across London and in the southeast. So this has had huge um, and broad reach. And we use these press quotes um, on the marketing, so it had five star reviews, and also that it was called the happiest exhibition in Britain. And so I thought that would be really nice for, um, for everyone post Christmas when everyone has the January blues. Um, and then a few weeks ago, the uh, BBC radio was recorded live from Tate Modern, and so it showcased music inspired by the exhibition. And the content has been underpinned underpinned by content, so with blogs, social media, and film, um, including this, which was a Twitter tour with the exhibition curator on the first day of the opening. Tate has two million Twitter followers, um, so this was a photo tour, and um, members of the public could ask the curator questions about the exhibition. And it was really successful with over 760,000 impressions, whereas normally we get about 100,000 impressions. And then a film with a UK celebrity called Dara O'Brien. Um, he has 2.18 million followers on Twitter, and um, he's presented um, many popular science and stargazing programs in the BBC. But he's also re really well known for being a comedian, so that's what most people would know him for. Um, so this film is exploring a different side of Alexander Calder's work. So this is looking at that mixture of art and science, um, because uh, Albert Einstein was really inspired by Calder, Alexander Calder's work, so it's looking at that. Um, so that film is going to launch next week, and it's, um, we've already agreed that some online magazines will be able to play the film first, and then also doing advertising on YouTube. And families are a core audience for Tate, and um, so we've created targeted market marketing communications to show that the exhibition is family friendly. And Tate um, Kids content has been developed. We had an exhibition review blog that was written by an 11 year old. And we've created activities that can be downloaded off the website um, and can be used in the exhibition space. And advertising has taken place on Facebook and in families, supplements in newspapers, and across all of Tate's channels, we have been promoting this message too. So the campaign has just launched this week, and um, this is a short, uh, a still from a short animation that we have created that's been inspired by the, um, the exhibition. And um, so this is, has been sent out to families, bloggers, and to, it's going to have some YouTube advertising. I just saw it being advertised on my Instagram earlier today. Um, so, and it's had a, a really nice reaction from, um, from audiences. But it's a, this idea that, um, that Tate is, is for families, and um, we've certainly seen that in our ticket sales, that we've had a, a significant number of families visiting. And overseas audiences have been targeted through partnerships and through advertising, so working with Visit London, so the tourism agency for London, we've created web content, um, Eurostar, which many Americans take, we've offered a, a ticket offer, a two-for-one ticket offer. We've worked with hotel partnerships, so a hotel in London is um, displaying advertising in their rooms, and this has all been done for free. Um, 
And then social media have been doing advertising on Facebook, targeting Americans in London. So you've now had a chance to hear about the strategy and you've been given some insight into the campaign. Um, so do have a, a look online to see the latest content. Um, the exhibition's on until April. And so if you're in London, do get a chance to come and see it for yourself. So in summary, in my presentation, I've given you an opportunity to hear about inspirational arts marketing in the UK and some of my experience at the v &A and Tate. So I've now got an opportunity for questions, if anybody would like to ask me anything. Um, Mamy tłumacza. <laughs> okay, one moment. Did you see? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, czy ktoś z Państwa ma pytania? Bo mamy czas. Tak, tutaj. Okay. Tu poprosimy o mikrofon. Uh, proszę poczekać, chwileczkę. I'm sorry, I just have to ask, how much money do you have for your activities? Um, I can say, I think I could safely say that it's, um, it's in the hundreds of, of thousands of pounds, yeah. <laughs> but in the whole budget of your institution, how much is for marketing? Oh, in terms of a percentage for, for marketing? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the breakdown would be for Tate, actually, but um, there's... It, it certainly is a significant amount of money for the, for the budget that does go into marketing. Um, in terms of all of the departments in Tate, marketing has the biggest spend, it has the biggest budgets. Um, so I don't know if I'd be able to tell you exactly what that breakdown is, but, but I certainly... More or less. Sorry? More or less. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One more, can I? Uh, how many people do you work with? How many in my team? Okay, so in the marketing team, um, so as I mentioned, there's four, um, four sites for Tate. So each site has a marketing manager and a marketing assistant. And then the social media is in our digital marketing team. So there's three in, in that team. We also have a marketing manager who looks after events and families and schools. And then we also have a team who work on membership. So there are three dedicated marketing people who work solely on membership, which I think is the, the biggest um, amount of marketing resource I've seen in, in the arts um, dedicated to membership. So that's at Tate. And I, th I think the, it shows because Tate has the, one of the biggest memberships in the world. Um, so I think it shows that once you then invest in, in staff, it does return. Thank you. Okay. Dziękujemy. Czy ktoś ma jeszcze jakieś pytania? Można podnosić rękę. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. I wanted to ask about your background. How did you start working for the arts? Because you told us about uh, coming from the same place, Shakespeare, but I wanted to ask about your professional track until yeah. going to the museums. Yeah, of course. Um, so I um, studied anthropology and communications at university. So I was really interested in culture. And whilst I was at university, I then worked at um, a, a museum just working in um, one of their offices as a temporary role in my summer holidays. And whilst I was there, I fell in love with museums. It was um, called the National Maritime Museum in London. So I worked there for three months and that then um, influenced some of the courses that they, I then took at university. And I did documentary making and um, make communications 
focused on museums. Um, and then following that, I then um, started working in the shop at the British Museum. And um, so because I knew I wanted to work in museums, but I had no idea what roles there were in museums. Um, and so I then started working there just for a few months to then be able to find out what roles there were in museums. And from there, I then worked at a very small museum called the Garden Museum. And I worked, um, I started out as a pers personal assistant and then um, worked in lots of different roles there because it was very small, called the Garden Museum, and um, ended up working as the visitor services manager. So I had a really good overview there of what, what it was like working um, across different roles in museums. But I really fell in love with working with audiences and working with marketing whilst I was there. So I then... Um, I then started a course and did a, a qualification in marketing whilst I was still working and then worked, at, worked my way through lots of different organisations um, and, and worked in, in marketing from there. And one more question. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dobrze, bo nie widzę. W takim razie, thank you, uh, Jesse, uh, for this inspired speech. Thank you very much okay. for having me. Thank you. Brawa.